Oh, we're live and welcome to day two of Photographers Unite. I got another fancy blue shirt on. My quarantine haircut is looking fresh. The crew is hydrated and caffeinated and we're ready to kick into it. So yeah, just want to thank everybody for tuning in yesterday for all of the donations and the supports. We've raised over $16,000 now um, and we got another great lineup of speakers and some of them are my favorite um so let me get into introducing our first speaker sam hurd is well known in the photography industry for his for his uh, lens chimping tech techniques as well as his epic portrait series of celebrities sam is not afraid to experiment his work balances a maturity beyond his ears with a charismatic freshness march and april brought sam's business to a grinding halt <laughs> yep Sounds familiar. After sitting on his hands for a while wondering what to do, Sam realized the worst thing he could do, what with being self-employed and all, was to do nothing. Losing output in creativity and business is a recipe for disaster. After putting out some feelers, Sam leaned on upon, uh, and leaned upon a new type of session that he could offer his clients. In this talk, Sam is going to outline exactly what he's offering, his previous wedding clients, his postponed wedding clients, his canceled wedding clients, and how he's leveraging that offering into new growth for his business through the rest of the year. Sam's talk is entitled Six Weddings in Two Six Zoom Weddings in Two Weeks, My Accidental New Business. Sam, the virtual stage is now yours. Thank you so much. This is fantastic. Okay, let me get my stuff going. Boop. Okay, we in good shape. Uh, I really appreciate that introduction. Um, obviously, <laughs> uh, a lot of um, what's happened in the past couple of months has been like rapidly evolving, even down to uh, what I've decided to talk about today um, uh, versus what was just described in my talk. And one of the big clarifying things I need to uh, point out that somebody just asked uh, this morning in my Instagram DMs is when I say Zoom wedding, <laughs> do I mean that I'm taking pictures through the Zoom session through like a laptop lens or something? And the answer is no, no, no. Uh, and that'll become very clear uh, as I get going in my presentation here. But um, before I dive too deeply into everything, I just wanted to say a quick thank you to everybody involved with this project. Uh, being that everything is being donated to charity uh, uh, is easily something I can get on board with and I'm, I'm proud to be a part of. So thank you for that. I know it's a ton of work uh, putting together a live stream and uh, yeah, well, just thank you. Um, before I get into like the, the details of kind of the Zoom wedding approach and what I've been doing literally in the last two and a half weeks to photograph six different um, elopements, Zoom weddings, micro weddings, whatever you want to call them. Uh, I want to talk about uh, this project of mine that I've been working on, which I think is going to be particularly helpful given the, the state of uh, the world these days. Uh, and it's called the state of the wedding photography industry. Uh, this is essentially a free annual report I'm trying to put together. This is the second year that I've done it. Um, and it's essentially results from, I think we're at 1,200 photographers now uh, in this last year. I gathered data basically through January, so before the coronavirus hit and all the horribleness that came with it. Uh, but you know, the data is a great picture of how the year 2019 looked for our industry. And I've always uh, struggled with sort of only having a good anecdotal sort of sense of how I'm operating in my business. Uh, you know, you can like read infinite uh, articles online about photographers, about the, what they charge in Washington State or what they charge in France or like all over the world. Everybody's got their own opinion of how their business is doing. And I've always kind of uh, yearned for like actual data to point to to see uh, maybe trends coming and going in, in our industry or, uh, and not just with the pricing, but like stylistic or social media trends or all that kind of stuff. Uh, the report is freely available. You can just go to state of the industry dot photo. Load it and uh, you know, obviously, in 2019, so things are going to shift quite a lot uh, for next year's report, which is why I'm super, super glad to have had, uh, you know, 2018, 2019 data compare against 2020 when next year rolls around. But I still think it's uh, worth a look at where things sat at the beginning of this year, <laughs> and I will follow up with a whole other kind of state of the industry report um, next year. So shameless uh, plug for that project, but it is free. It's 100% uh, just to give back to the industry so that all of us can make, hopefully, uh, more informed decisions 
uh, decisions about our business. Um, okay, on to what I want to talk about. So this photo here and every photo you, you see in this entire presentation uh, was made in the last uh, two and a half, three-ish weeks, something like that. Um, I've been very busy and I've, uh, I, you know, I went through a state of panic. Like I mentioned, my business you know, dried up essentially in April and uh, in March. And I, I kind of gave myself about three days, four days, um, feverishly looking at the news, tuning in live to every press conference that our government was was saying. And, and I, I give myself <laughs> offering my wedding terms of stuff would eventually start to sort of apply um, to the world uh, now. And, and I realized it's going to be a while before those those wedding packages really make sense uh, for the way weddings need to unfold, especially over the next six months. Hopefully by next year, things will look better. Uh, this couple reached out to me, uh, I don't know exactly when, maybe late March or something, and said we were supposed to get married in Texas, big wedding, you know, kind of a classic uh, template for what a wedding would look like. And we can no longer do that. Obviously, we are stuck here in Virginia. Would you like to come photograph our Zoom wedding? We're setting up a laptop and we are a couple iPads. We're going to do a, a, you know, 20 yard <laughs> procession in. No, probably more like 10 yards. I'm horrible at distances. <laughs> but uh, she basically just hit around the corner with her neighbor, Bob, uh, with an iPad and then walked in, processed in to meet her groom. Uh, waiting by a laptop with about a hundred, I think, friends and family tuning in over Zoom, and um, you know, it kind of opened my eyes uh, to what things could maybe look like for, you know, certainly in the next month uh, if people are willing to do this. But I, I'm actually beginning to think maybe that through the summer, and if not parts of uh, of the fall. Um, and one of the surprising things about this whole um, ceremony. They did about an hour, hour and a half uh, ceremony. Well, it was an hour ceremony, about a half hour of shooting like extra kind of creative photos. One of the surprising things that I found in this uh, was how people interacted with the Zoom session. It wasn't just like a dummy piece of technology sitting there observing like the, the eye of God, just, just monitoring. They actually would turn to it and often uh, interact and engage with their guests. They had two actual, maybe three guests in attendance, like literally 25 yards away sitting on benches and uh, keeping their distance. And of course, I kept my distance as well, wearing a mask through through all of all of these weddings, not just this one. But, um, you know, they got incredibly creative with like having a little cake cutting, a little champagne toast. They kind of went through all the, the high points of what you would do uh, during most weddings, but in a really condensed sort of format uh, and just hot spotting to their phone. And, um, you know, I took this session, I blogged it immediately, kind of uh, curating for certain keywords. Uh, obviously, Zoom wedding being one of them. Uh, coffee break, one second. If I'm, there's about five shots of espressos in here. If I'm not shaking, uh, then coffee's not working. <laughs> Um, anyway, I blogged the heck out of this, and at the same time, along with taking still photos, the entire um, ceremony, I was taking GoPro footage. And this is something that I got kind of comfortable doing anyway uh, with a lot of my kind of online educational resources. I liked just hitting record whenever I thought I was making an interesting portrait or like, you know, an opportunity to talk about in a deconstruction would pop up. I would hit record on the GoPro and do it anyway. But I, I realized in the moment shooting this wedding, like I should have beginning and end coverage of this entire ceremony because these these aren't clients that their first choice was to elope, right? You can't take uh, a standard elopement package and just start offering it to uh, clients that otherwise would have wanted a wedding with 100 plus guests. Um, and what you need to think about as a photographer, I believe, is is what you can do to, I guess, uh, do something to, to bring in um, – a closer connection to what happened to the day. So of course the photos are infinitely valuable. Like I'm so glad they hired a still photographer, but a lot of these may not have a big, big wedding again, may, you know, postpone uh, the reception to next year. And I wanted something immediate that I could turn around to them that required no extra work for me. And the GoPro footage, uh, turned out to be a really great solution to that. About an hour of footage that I can upload in their client gallery that evening really uh, kind of connects their um, hundred plus guests, uh, you, know, um, a, a, you know, immediately, uh, com in, you know, along with a couple of uh, uh, still photos to, to go with it. Uh, and 
of course, uh, turning around your still photo time to be maybe a couple weeks instead of uh, you know, six to eight weeks, whatever your standard turnaround time is, I would modify that for any type of you know, smaller elopement or Zoom wedding like this. And then I highly recommend uh, one of these kind of GoPro things. Um, that uh, blog post led to another booking with a couple actually outside of New York City of all places uh, doing an elopement with a full Catholic mass, an hour long Catholic mass. Uh, they didn't wear masks. I did. Um, and a their two kind of friends that were guests wore masks. Um, and then right afterward, we just walked around for a quick session uh, sort of in the neighborhood uh, of where they lived. Uh, this was a backyard full on uh, sort of Indian ceremony. I forgot what the structure is called, but they these were actually previous wedding clients of mine who had outright canceled. And then a week before uh, their original date reached out to me and said, hey, we're gonna do something small in the backyard. Are you willing to come? And I was, absolutely, I'll be there no matter what. And uh, it was fascinating and, and interesting to see like this entire series of family photos with everybody except the bride and groom wearing masks. Uh, I think in the moment, uh, people are, perhaps not that excited about having to wear masks during uh, family pictures, but give it another five or 10 years and that'll be a fantastic story uh, to talk about, uh, hopefully. Um, yeah, and, and again, we just did like a little session right after the formality of the ceremony, right right in their backyard the whole time. And I, that evening, dumped the GoPro footage to their uh, full gallery and they were able to spread that around and share with friends and family until you know I got the, the final photos ready. Um, and it doesn't have to be complicated. I uh, would honestly recommend putting together a short list of client materials, just resources, uh, kind of best things to think about. I don't think it's a good idea for you as a photographer to assume the responsibility of managing the Zoom session. I think that's probably the worst thing. Uh, whatever you do to adjust your business to the current market, uh, you know, make sure it's not taking away from your core craft of being an excellent wedding photographer. <laughs> um, that's what's so thrilling about these I'm going to talk about the three that I've tested. You can just kind of hit record and then set it and forget it. It doesn't interfere, even though I'm taking video, with any of my actual ability to document the, the wedding. Uh, this couple went as simple as an iPhone just on a, on a stand and put it between them and had uh, her mom, friend, and one of their mutual close friends in attendance. And then they kind of unfolded again with a cake cutting, a couple of little champagne toasts, a little dance next to a bench. And this is just in a park uh, down in or up in sort of the Hamptons area of New York, kind of out of the dense city area. Um, and it was an amazing time. And they're rescheduling their session to be uh, or their reception, sorry, to be uh, later next year. Um, yeah. Anyway, I've done about six of these. I don't have examples from every single wedding. This one, again, was sort of a, the backyard of a couple. And there's something kind of special, I think, to the, the couple doing some of the legwork themselves in terms of how many different Zoom sessions they have, how, what cameras are used, the positioning of it. When I write, I do give a little guidance in terms of the lighting and the direction of uh, where people should stand and stuff like that. You have a lot more flexibility when it's you know six people in attendance instead of uh, a couple hundred. Uh, but... Yeah, these these all worked out really well, and uh, this is something that has resulted by we the pure stuck at home quarantine. Where I anyway, I'm not going to go into it for this presentation, but in case you're wondering what's going on in this shot, um, keep wondering. <laughs> um, so I've seen couples do everything from a simple like hour, hour and a half ceremony with a simple photo session to three hours with a ceremony and a couple different locations for photo sessions to this Sunday doing a full 10 hour day of shooting. Of course, their wedding looked nothing like anybody else's, but they had fantastic gift of their family lived in sort of the drivable uh, sort of neighborhoods and areas uh, where they wanted um, to, to potentially do the ceremony. And so they rented an incredibly cool car and drove from one house to the next, uh, basically meeting people in their front or backyards and doing with social distancing <laughs> photos without masks and doing some photos with masks so a little bit closer together. Uh, so they went to, you know, uh, I want to say six different family members, spent a little bit of time with them. It did, of course, some some cake cutting and some champagne toast and then some some family photos uh, along with the actual ceremony. The bill for. So again, it looks totally different than what I would normally do uh, in your kind of more traditional wedding, but I was still able to bill, uh, you know, an account for a, a pretty typical wedding day for me in terms of revenue. <laughs> Um, so this worked out beautifully. And what I've been really excited to see is sort of what clients are bringing to the table and just listening to the, again, like the market response of what's happening. 
And uh, as things evolve, uh, change like by next week, but I put together new pricing uh, and I have three packages that I just want to show you what those look like right now. Uh, if somebody inquires either a previous client or uh, you know a new client that's you know, reaching out out of the blue uh, and they want to do sort of a Zoom wedding or an elopement of some kind or whatever keyword they're putting in there, uh, I have three different things that I can present to them as an option. And uh, starting with package one kind of accounts for a straightforward hour and a half of coverage and um, no GoPro footage. Even though I might still record it anyway, it's not like a line item in the contract of something they can expect. Um, yeah, it's pretty straightforward with a link to a, a gallery of exactly what that might look like. Um, and then I have a middle package. And I meant to start with this, but I highly recommend always having three packages in whatever you uh, present to clients because it gives you some data depending on how packages are booked or not. Like my rule has always been, okay, you've got three packages. Package one is cheap. Package two is medium. Package three is most expensive. And package one is booked easiest and most often um hold on one second if your cheapest package is booked the easiest and most often you probably need to trend your prices down uh because people are just barely able to budget and make it happen uh package three is booked the most often then it's my feeling that you should trend your packages more expensive um, always optimizing for that middle package uh being booked the most often and it's easiest to adjust by price to account for that, or uh, you can also adjust by what's included in the offerings. Obviously, what you do during an elopement, <laughs> it's kind of hard to come up with a variety of things to offer, but that's where the GoPro footage comes in handy. Uh, the difference between uh, my cheapest package and my middle package is uh, more time for coverage, three hours, and the uh, GoPro footage of the ceremony is included. Just the off, which I don't have to do any extra work and clients get it, you know, really, really fast turnaround that evening or, or the next day. Uh, and then I have the most expensive package with a little bit of like a template of what the day could look like. Cause I don't think a lot of couples think about, uh, what could you possibly do for six plus hours? Um, <laughs> just people attending a ceremony. You can still do ready photos at a like that that can take about an hour you can still do a small first look a ceremony and if you know they're set up with family nearby they can do uh you know a, a car kind of um parade <laughs> to their various family members and meet them outside their homes and all that takes an incredible amount of time when you add it all up uh, and it surpass six hours of coverage uh, again along with the uh, gopro ceremony uh, footage um, so that's kind of what my packaging looks like right now, and I'm sort of optimizing depending on uh, how things go. But the worst thing you could do is sit down and uh, wait for all of this to sort of blow over and hope that uh, what you previously offered your wedding clients will will take. I think it's going to be well into next year before that's um, the case. Uh, so you know, be mindful of that. Uh, now, I just want to talk quickly. Maybe do a time check. I think we should be good. Yep, a few more minutes. Quickly about the three devices I've played with and kind of where their strengths are so you can uh, optimize for however into it you want to get or not. Uh, I've played around with three different ones, the GoPro Hero 8, which is this guy here. They're all fairly small and lightweight, so that's not a big deal. Uh, the big advantage with the GoPro Hero 8 is that it has a media mod, which is like 80 bucks, which actually wraps around the GoPro core camera that you can buy, and it allows for HDMI out and uh, eighth inch audio. So if you wanted to do higher quality audio, like a microphone or something, um, you can get a wireless mic and plug right into that, which is is really great. It also supports live streaming, but I found it to not be all that reliable. Um, the DJI Osmo Action, sort of like a GoPro, this is the one I end if you kind of want the best of all worlds. It has um, the most stable live stream I've come across and it live streams directly to YouTube. So does the GoPro. Um, you can uh, put a log emulation, which I don't know, and I'm talking to mostly photographers, but log basically flattens the raw footage so that if you do want to color grade and edit it later, uh, it's a little more, um, uh, suited for that. And then this one I just got, which is a 360 uh, recording video. It does not do live streaming, but the bonus for this is if it's mounted to your camera or you go portrait orientation or something like that, you can actually edit the footage later in post and keep everything perfectly steady and perfectly uh, horizontal horizon lines the entire time uh, because it captures literally the entire um, visual 360 field uh, across the entire thing, but there's a lot more work to do in post with, with this footage. Um, so those are the three I would look at. I would, if you're just, 
you don't care to research or you want the most straightforward option, I would go with the GI Osmo uh, action. And uh, one of the sort of random things that happen to work out. I use PicTime for my client galleries, and uh, PicTime has a beautiful ability to embed uh, video that you can host through YouTube or through Vimeo. So uh, here's a wedding I just shot a, uh, last weekend, and uh, these are all the still photos, of course, but uh, broken out somewhere. Oh, this is the one. Uh, my one and and uh, broken down at the very bottom here. I have the raw GoPro footage uh, hosted at Vimeo um, and easily playable and uh, download clients if you want to give them the download permission. Of course, given the nature of the live stream, of course, something had to not load. But here it is. Uh, part one, part two. I just break it up into things. Um, right along the rest of the photos. So, uh, you know, as they this link yes uh, there's even more incentive for people to do that um yeah that's what it looks like uh but one quick extra bonus i know i'm running uh, short on time if you can configure the live stream to work again I, I highly recommend the dji osmo action you can create a simple youtube link that gets embedded in a picktime gallery picktime isn't set up to to be used uh, for any type of live streaming, but they do let you add video and i found out if when you go to create your gallery you click add video and just paste a youtube link to your YouTube live stream, it embeds in the gallery. So what I've been working on is a way to pre-register guests to a pick time gallery. Again, ultimately where their high res still photos are gonna live anyway. Um, let them tune in live to the ceremony, which looks exactly like this. I'm gonna do a playback. Obviously this isn't live, but uh, this is the live portion of what their first dance looked like right after the ceremony. And guests could tune in and see this right in my branded um, client gallery uh, seamlessly. Obviously there's a lot of things to account for in terms of a live streams, uh, cellular reception, battery life, all that kind of stuff. You need to practice like crazy in your backyard and maybe offset somewhere safe from your house. But uh, it's pretty cool for guests to tune in and have a different perspective that's a little more engaging. You know, I'm the, the photographer, so my camera tends to be pointed, unless it's down by my side, <laughs> uh, my camera tends to be pointed uh, throughout the uh, ceremony, for sure. It also lends itself really well to photographers that are single camera shooters. If you do a lot of dual camera, it's going to be really tough to find a way to to make the live stream or even the GoPro footage at all work really well. So I would I would definitely think and consider single camera only for the ceremony if possible. Um, but yeah, it's pretty fun. And the audio is actually sort of usable. You can kind of hear what people are saying. And again, at the same time as it's doing a live stream, these cameras both let you uh, record the HD footage directly to the SD card. So even if the stream breaks or something like that, uh, you can still give clients something, uh, you know, something as, as a backup or whatever. It really, really high quality. We're going to yeah. jump in uh, just so yep. we have some time for some Q&A because People are really Absolutely. curious. Cool. On that was what basically my, my final point that I wanted to make anyway. Happy I, to take any Q&A. I told you it was going to help you with the landing. Um, one of our questions is <laughs> what type of like equipment and lenses are you using and like other kind of, I guess, procedures that you're putting in place to make sure that you're keeping a safe distance? Yeah, I, mean, it, I of course, where I have a pack of N95 masks. I didn't, I should have uh, brought one with me. I'm wearing a mask the whole time. I have copious amounts of hand sanitizer, thankfully. Uh, and I live in Baltimore. We have many, many, um, uh, distilleries that sort of upended their business to like basically overnight start offering, uh, really affordable hand sanitizer. So I just have many bottles of that. And, and that's about it. I mean, I probably trend a little bit more toward like an 85 millimeter lens or something like that. So I'm photographing from a distance, but I, and sure ahead of time talking to clients that you know the guest list is, is very small and there's there's not any dense indoor tons of people around um, type of situations that that I have to fight through uh, you know and all of my clients have been very uh, upfront about you know we only want you to do this if you're comfortable they've been very um, great about that so that that's it just a mask hand sanitizer and then yeah actually keep your distance <laughs> nice um, and then we have another question on like where are you placing the GoPro or are you just putting it on the hot shoot or like putting it on a tripod yeah so all GoPros or I, I go but that's just the one that kind of came first all of these have different names than that but they all have little mountable uh, hot shoe mount things so I'm literally mounting it into of my D uh, my mirrorless camera with EOS R so it's mounted there you hit record and and you go for it 
And yeah. what was it exactly about um, using one camera that you're recommending? Oh, well, if you do want to offer GoPro footage as something to kind of give clients uh, right away to share with their extended friends and family, uh, the single, if you body, I do two GoPros, one on each body, uh, which is sort of a crazy, I, I couldn't even do that. Um, the single one is, is most likely to have sort of a stable, something interesting in the view. If you shoot two bodies, you're going to put one down and the GoPro is like pointed at the ground or the grass or something like that. That could be maybe compensated for with the 360 camera that I talked about. I actually shot a wedding with this yesterday. This element or, or a zoom wedding, whatever you want to call it. And uh, I'm going to see if maybe even if my camera's down by the side, the footage is still usable from this. But that's the big thing. You don't want you know, half the footage to be your, your camera pointed at the grass. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Sam, that's it. Um, yeah. Thank you for opening it up. Like I think a lot of people have been feeling stumped and like unsure what they can be offering and like how to adjust to the yeah. climate. So really appreciate it. Yeah. And I mean, you know, these are all just, I, this is an evolution and, you know, in terms of just something our response adjust optimize from there but not sit around and wait for what you previously because you're going to be waiting you know potentially a year yeah uh, yeah and i want a busy fall so cool all right sam well you enjoy the rest of your day thank you for so thanks much for your for attention being i appreciate it yeah take it easy bye all right before we get into our break, we have another giveaway. Um, all our giveaways will be contacted by email. This time it's from Narrative App and they're giving a one year, a one year membership on Narrative Select. Narrative's, yeah, it's pretty cool. Plugs right into Lightroom and really streamlines the blogging process. Um, so check it out and we'll be back and after a short break with our next speaker, Victor Lax. See you soon. <laughs> 